I want to welcome everyone back to AI Showbiz Summit 4.0. We have the panel Coronavirus and Impact to Those with Disability with Joe Devin moderating, and he'll take the introductions from there. I will uh, turn it over to you, very capable person, Joe Devin, and I will be closed captioning in the chats for those that uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Molly. Much appreciated. Um, I'm going to give you a second to just get that closed caption going. Uh, we should see a little button that says closed caption pop up. Uh, actually, uh, you won't see a button because I oh. am your closed caption. I am typing okay. what you say in the chat, okay. which is the modern version of closed captioning. Uh, okay. And it's a more direct method. For, so all the people also in the audience will see it in case okay they're not familiar. Great. So thank you so much, Molly, for this opportunity once again to ha moderate a panel at uh, AI Showbiz. Um, accessibility, which refers to making digital products accessible to people with disabilities, is uh, something that a lot of people need to know about and they don't. So we really appreciate this opportunity to bring it to a wider tech audience. Uh, my name is Joe Devin, and I am co-founder of Diamond, which is a digital agency focused on building inclusive, well-crafted software. Uh, I also co-founded Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which was meant to bring uh, accessibility awareness to developers, designers, and anybody involved in building digital products. Uh, and it's uh, a day that goes viral every year. And it's through that that I've met these wonderful panelists. So I'm going to give each of you a chance to introduce yourselves. Sharon, would you like to go first? You're on, you're on mute. Sure, I'd love to go first and uh, be reminded to unmute. My name is Sharon Rush, and I wanna first thank you, Joe, for inviting me to be part of this. You know, uh, I love to talk about accessibility whenever anyone will let me. And Molly, thank you for putting all this together. It's a great event. Um, I am the co-founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization based in Austin, Texas. It's called Nobility and spelled with a K just to confuse everybody. Um, we have advocated and organized communities around the issue of accessibility for about 20 years. And I think a lot of my impetus for this comes from being one of a family of eight children. And I always think things work better when they work for everyone. So accessibility is important to me. Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you, Sharon. Nancy, would you like to go next? Sure, my name is Nancy Lank Ellis and I'm currently on the Santa Monica's Disabilities Commission. I'm the past chair. Um, I am known for uh, starting the open caption movie program, which put deaf and hard of hearing people into commercial theaters so that they could see first one films at the same time as their hearing peers. Um, from there, I was able to meet and expand into working on the FCC, the World Institute on Disabilities, among others. I worked on the State Rehabilitation Council, and I'm currently on the uh, NIH's uh, National Institute of Deafness and Communication Disorders. So uh, I've gone from being somebody who was uh, deaf growing up without the ADA and any kind of technology until I got my first cochlear implant, which led me to be able to use the telephone and put deaf people in movie theaters. And that was 23 years ago. And as of now, uh, people are able to go to movies all over the country in any movie theater. So um, my interest in accessibility is as a deaf woman um, going into airports, going into hospitals, um, the challenge of people wearing masks right now where uh, the majority of people with hearing loss can't need to read lips and can't understand. And social distancing is also a problem because we're not up close enough to be able to uh, hear or try to make do. Uh, it's hard enough without a mask, but now it's virtually impossible. And without captions or um, if you use American Sign Language to have somebody to help you. I, I think you notice in all of the daily updates from um, Governor Cuomo and uh, Gavin Newsom in the state of uh, California, that they always have a sign language person in 
behind them, and they always have closed captions in the lower third. Uh, without an emergency uh, notice, uh, especially an earthquake or hurricanes or whatnot, people who require them are just, um, they're left out of the loop. And it's, uh, especially in a pandemic where our accommodations have been placed, now they're completely disrupted. And trying to get those back in a way to make us safe uh, is a challenge. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And, and that's, that's really important. People are not aware that uh, when, when you're not providing captions, you have an entire audience that doesn't hear the orders, and then they don't hear the orders, it affects everybody. So if, if it's not, if people don't realize that it's important to do this um, for people with disabilities, here you, you see where it impacts everybody. So thank you for your work there. Now I'll pass it to you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Joe. And uh, Molly, thank you for um, both of you guys for uh, yeah, inviting me to speak on this panel and to be a part of this great event. Uh, I'm the IT Accessibility Coordinator for North Idaho College. And prior to that, I uh, did similar work for Big Bend Community College. Um, I guess the biggest accomplishment in both is just getting an accessibility policy, policy established. But as, um, as you all well know, um, that's only where the work begins. <laughs> Um, I've been working in accessibility mainly from web technologies perspective um, since 2003. Um, and on top of this, I also um, am a professor of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And um, I'd like to share a great story to kind of explain um, where my passion comes from. I had, a, when I was at Big Bend, I had a student that had a brachial plex um, injury from when she was born. She couldn't use her left arm. And she also didn't think she could do self-defense or jujitsu. And I, you know, I said, well, let's let's see what we can figure out, what, what we can adapt for you. Uh, long story short, she enjoyed it, came back, started training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I think two or three years later, went on to winning a world title um, at the Abu Dhabi, one of the biggest tournaments in the world. And it really uh, kind of you know, captivates my passion for accessibility, not just Brazilian jiu-jitsu, is that you know, how many people out there who don't think they can do something just need a little bit of accommodation and they're going to be rock star world champions like that. And so I think that's, that's kind of what drives me is trying to really help people realize that they, they can do more than they think they can. Um, and so that's why I'm here and I just am looking to push accessibility forward where, however I can. I love that story. Um, I'm not sure. going to, I'm not going to leave you off the hook just yet because um, you have an interesting, is that a hoodie or a sweater? Oh, I mean this, uh, wait, this one? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's actually how I um, met uh, Joe. Um, long story short, I'm um, also part of uh, American University of Beirut's ABLE Summit. Um, I'm a board member. Um, I met the co-founder of GAD before I actually knew he was a co-founder, um, Jenison Asuncion. Jenison introduced me to Joe and with our first uh, event that we had at North Idaho College um, called Pave the Way to GAD, I was able to get Joe um, and I think Joe did some convincing of Jenison and get I got both of the uh, co-founders to join us at that event uh, last year. So uh, I was pretty proud of that and I was uh, glad, even um, happier that I got to make a couple new friends that way. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. I don't know if you guys are ready, but I'm going to ask a question that I've never asked. I've done panels for about a decade now, and I've never asked this question. At the end of this panel, the transcript is going to be sent into outer space, literally. So what is your message to any aliens that might be listening? Might as well, let's start with Sharon. Who has to unmute? Again. I think I would advise them to, I'm, this, this is kind of a cop out. I would advise them to go look at the Voyager. You know, the Voyager that was put together under the Carter administration and um, Carl Sagan was very instrumental in putting it all together. I think it's such a great message to the 
alien cultures or anyone. It's a good message for all of us because it's so steeped in diversity. And it shows that there are many ways to express, many ways to understand the world. And it goes, uh, there are things from so many different cultures. And, uh, and some of the, the, the music that was included was by a blind guitarist, Blind Lemon Jefferson. And, you know, just the idea that you don't have to come to the world in any one particular way in order to contribute to it and to benefit from it. So I, I think that they did a pretty good job on that. And I don't think I could improve on it very much. I might include Aretha Franklin in the music. But. <laughs> and anything about accessibility? How does accessibility well, see, relate I to aliens? Think that's the thing is I don't think accessibility should be a separate consideration. When you start thinking about diversity and different ways to express yourself and different ways to understand the world, and you design in this broad way that includes everyone and is respectful of all those modes of understanding, I think accessibility then becomes a given rather than a separate consideration. And I think that's really, really an important way to conceive of it. And so I would trust those aliens to get the, that message that, you know, things are better when you include everyone and uh, make messages in a way that can be understood by the broadest number of people, whatever galaxy they come from. I love it. <laughs> How about you, Nancy? Just piggy piggybacking on what she said. I think the important thing is that they know that we all communicate in different ways. Um, so that if they were talking to somebody who was blind or somebody who was deaf uh, using ASL, or you look at the Maoris in New Zealand, the way that they approach people coming in, uh, speaking their language, and they have a certain cultural way that they introduce themselves. Um, I think it's, I, I, you know, hope that they see that we are warm and welcoming and inclusive and want them to investigate the entire globe. Um, I'm not sure that um, accessibility is a separate option because I think it's just an, another way for them to see how we communicate. And I don't think they'll be able to differentiate because we don't know how they'll be able to communicate with us. It could be uh, like music, you know, from a Steven Spielberg movie. So uh, we don't know what we don't know, but uh, I agree with uh, Sharon about Voyager. Excellent. Maybe they'll be using a screen reader. Correct. Correct. Uh, Jeremy. Well, yeah, actually, I'll just piggyback um, both what Sharon and Nancy said. Um, it's tough to follow those two on a, such a good question. Um, I think I would, uh, the only thing left to ask them is, um, hey, um, can you confirm Bigfoot's real and are you working with them? That's, a, <laughs> that's the only thing I have really other uh, that I'd be questioning the aliens about. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious about Area 51. <laughs> I actually uh, drove out there one time uh, just for fun, uh, so it, it was it was interesting. And you're um, still here. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this conference is called AI Showbiz. So, with that in mind, any thoughts about artificial intelligence and disabilities, and making sure that uh, that AI does not exclude, or is it good that they exclude people with disabilities due to the privacy concerns? So let's go back the other way. So I'll start with you, Jeremy. Um, I think there's a, a lot of potential with artificial intelligence, as we've already seen with some of the things developing. Um, to limit one of my examples, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Microsoft's seeing AI app that they have. Um, I've been able to talk with uh, some of the folks that have developed that and see the work that's gone into getting that app to recognize everyday objects and then also to be able to customize that to recognize people's faces. And I think that's it, it's an example of, of how AI could really be leveraged um, to help not just um, people with disabilities, but everybody. Uh, on, on top of that, though, I think uh, my biggest concern around AI is you almost have to work in parallel of addressing the artificial intelligence or sorry, the accessibility, privacy, and the security, um, because it, it, those three are so important with any kind of AI. Thank you, Nancy. 
think for uh, the deaf and hard of hearing and low vision community, I think uh, things like Alexis, um, the uh, uh, wireless uh, Otter and Live Transcribe, which allow people to um, attend classes and, and you know do things where there is um, there is transcription that they can be putting next to the computer. I think the uh, the whole Zoom platform. Um, is working on, you know, captions and uh, audio description. Uh, it's not there yet, but since this, we've all been uh, thrown into the Zoom environment because of, you know, being, you know, safer at home. Uh, I think it's provided, uh, it's caused many challenges for people in all kinds of disabilities, uh, particularly, as I say, the deaf and the low vision. Um, in terms of show business, uh, most of not all, but most of the different um, forms, movies, television, um, theater, have um, already created their versions of, you know, they have sign language interpreters and they have, they have cart at uh, most of the major uh, theaters in, and I mean, uh, like live theaters. Uh, they may have one day, but uh, it's, it's a totally accessible day. Um, for other disabilities, it's a challenge um, because they may not be able to use Alexa. They may not be able to use um, other things where they have. They might have, you know, manual disabilities. So I think for for the deaf people, it's it's taken leaps and bounds. Uh, but I'm not so sure about other disabilities. Uh, I know that, you know, like when they created curb cuts for people with wheelchairs. Uh, the first thing that happened was blind people were being kit killed by cars because they didn't realize that the curb came to an end, which is where we got our talking um, streetlights, which we had in Santa Monica. Um, and that also goes to accessible parks and, you know, and, and whatnot. Uh, I think there's a great future in AI um, in, in, in a non um show business uh, application, the FCC uh, has created uh, funding for emergency telehealth meetings. So people who need to go to their doctors, uh, and then there's a fund also to provide so that the, the doctors will be reimbursed for anything that it costs them to do so that they can avail themselves to emergency and you know doctor visits and you know things that nobody thinks about. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, I learned something new every day that, that I did not know about that curb cuts. Uh, and that's so interesting that that brought about the uh, the talking uh, street street lights. Fascinating. Um, and, and it just shows over and over again that, that how hard it is with government that you just don't know that it's, it's unintended consequences of every action that you take. It, it just makes things so difficult. All right, Sharon. Yeah, I didn't know that either, Nancy. That was uh, that was interesting. That uh, about about blind people wandering into traffic once the curb cuts were in place. That's that's a little startling to me, actually. Um, you know, sometimes I I tell myself that I'm looking forward to when the machines take over, because I think, my gosh, they couldn't do worse than we've done up to now. Um, when you just see all the injustice and and the I mean I caught the tail end of the program that was right before ours about about slavery and those you know it's just it's I think machines when they are uh, well programmed and there's the there's the um, there's the problem is because they're they're programmed and they're tend to be prejudices, our human prejudices get built into the programming. And so I think there was a lot of alarm when screen reader users realized that Apple had put a detector in the, you know, that they could detect now when you show up to their applications with a screen reader. And so your identity then is, you're outed, so to speak, without your own volition. And that was not the intention. I mean, Apple has been such a pioneer in accessibility and just trying to solve a problem, you you 
offend people or cross a line of privacy or security that you did not intend to pass, to to cross. And so those things have to be given really careful consideration as they're implemented. And just like Nancy just told us that story about curb cuts. And and sometimes it's it's very difficult and maybe even impossible to anticipate all those consequences. But I think sometimes we get carried away with the wow factor and we move forward with something because we think, oh, that's so cool, without really thinking about, okay, so how will this impact someone with this disability or that one or cognitive disabilities or another one that are really, really hard to address. So I would just say that as we implement these artificial intelligence mechanisms that we use our own human intelligence to the best we can in order to, to make it um, really effective for everybody. For sure. Um, <clears throat> Lainey Feingold recently was speaking about uh, privacy and how, and I'm only bringing this up because you, you started talking about uh, the privacy of the screen reader, uh, which is really kind of an anti-pattern in the sense that you shouldn't be doing browser sniffing. That's an old thing that, that they used to do a lot of, uh, send different data to different browsers instead of just handling um, standards properly and making it fit for everybody. Um, in any event, uh, the, the, it was so interesting. I was on a panel for Amazon who, who took our Global Accessibility Awareness Day idea and turned it into Global Accessibility Awareness Month. Uh, so we did a kickoff, and, and Jenison, who was blind uh, himself, was saying that he didn't even think about the privacy implications uh, because if you are blind, for example, and you have to ask somebody else for help, you know, that inability to have independence means that if you're seeing a movie, for example, you may not want people to know what movie you're, you're watching or you may be, you know, whether it's going to a website or whatever your activities are, a lot of this is about privacy as well. So before I get to my next question, anybody want to comment on that? I'll take that as a no. So then I will ask you uh, how to speak to your journey into accessibility. How did you get into it? And uh, what has your journey been like? What have you learned? Um, just to give you an idea for, for me, um, having co-founded this day, I, I've got to say that it's brought me a lot more than I brought to it. And it has been uh, just world changing in terms of, of understanding different people's perspective. Um, so that's taught me a lot. So Sharon, I'll, I'll pass that to you. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because I didn't, I didn't really think about digital accessibility much. I had a, a associate's degree in computer science when I was in my 20s long time ago but in the my 90 in the 90s i found myself working for easter seals trying to develop employment opportunities and that was at a time when my town of austin texas was being completely remade by startups and technology and we were trying to become a technology hub and so i thought wow yeah technology for people with disabilities awesome awesome way to make a living but then as I tried to develop those opportunities, I kept finding these barriers. And so it was just by trying to use technology as an employment means for people with disabilities that led me to understand, well, it's not that people aren't capable of doing this work. It's that the technology is not properly designed to enable them to do it. And so that was kind of what started my journey uh, trying to engage the, the tech community itself. And in Austin at that time, everything was competitive. So we started a contest, an accessible web design contest. And most people then would say, what do you mean accessible? Bandwidth, connectivity? They didn't understand that accessibility and people with disabilities was even an issue. And as you sort of open their minds to that, it was really great to see developers actually jump in and try to solve the problem. And that's what our that's what our contest did. And then eventually that led to founding the organization with that as a laser focus. And I agree with you that when you when you start into that journey, you get back much more than what you what you put into it, because the community is so responsive and so 
eager to make progress. And it's it's a very wonderful journey. Yeah, and and I think uh, one of the thing the perspective is is so important because you when you're looking when you're watching TV and you're seeing people with disabilities on TV, you're just seeing often a caricature, but you don't realize that these are human beings, some of which are, and and it might be any one of us could become could have some kind of disability over time and mo- most likely will um, as you get older and. It's just people. Everybody has their own uniqueness, and uh, you just look at it differently as opposed to this is someone who is blind or someone who is deaf or, you know, uh, uh, has some kind of disability. But I don't know. It's hard to explain this if you haven't gone through uh, uh, accessing the community. So, um, Nancy, I'll pass this on to you uh, about your experiences and your journey in the world of accessibility. Uh, which obviously also had a a strong personal element. Uh, First of all, I want to tell Sharon that Austin, Texas, has the largest number of deaf-owned businesses of any other city in the United States. So whether you've seen that or not. Oh, uh, no, absolutely. I've seen that. There was a sandwich shop on South Congress. Right. The entire staff is deaf. We go there for lunch quite quite well. Not, Not these days, but... It's, uh, well, I started to lose my hearing at age four uh, due to uh, a drug given to me as a child. The drug saved my life, but I started to lose my hearing and no one noticed it until I was 10. And at that point, uh, we had moved to California and they waited for me and I was fitted for hearing aids. And the man who fitted me was 78 years old and he wore hearing aids himself. And... um, you know, once he fitted me and said, have a nice life, and I went off. And I never met another person who looked like me until I was 43 years of age. And I happened to come upon a, sc- a school and a program uh, where they were all deaf kids being taught with hearing kids. And the parents were all learning to sign. Well, I don't sign. And the majority of people with hearing loss do not. So I found myself meeting deaf people, but not being included. And then I got my first cochlear implant. That put me on the phone. And that's when I decided that I wanted to put deaf people in movie theaters. So I went from knowing no one to knowing practically every deaf person on the planet. Uh, Being uh, Starting with tripod caption films and then Insight Cinema, both nonprofits. Um, And I would would go to all the different various conventions. And it, it, it was amazing to me to see how many different organizations were about involved with deaf people, but how different they were and how different their perspectives were. So I got a pretty good idea of, you know, who you say and what you say it to, because everybody has, you know, has strong feelings, but the reality is we're all deaf. You take off my cochlear implants, I'm just as deaf as somebody who signs. Um, I think that um, being, deaf or losing my hearing when um, pre-ADA, pre-text machines, pre-fax machines, uh, pre-pagers, um, you learn how to be resourceful. And one of my famous stories is I was living in New York and my husband was a music agent, which made it even worse because I couldn't understand music. And we both worked on 57th Street near Fifth Avenue. And so and I didn't use a telephone. And so I would go into Bergdorf Goodman into the men's department because there was never anybody in the men's department. And I would say, um, would you mind making a phone call for me? And they'd say, sure. So they would call my husband and I'd say, I'm going home. I'm going to the grocery store. Do you need anything? So they would tell him and, and he would give them the list and they would give me and I would go off on my merry way. So that was my version of a relay service. And so people today don't, you know, understand that you had to be resourceful in, in how you communicated. So my life changed when the fax machine came in, because that was kind of like my talking telephone. I went through Northridge earthquake, not having any idea what happened because there was no captioning then. There was no emergency, uh, you know, uh, uh, notices there was no scroll according to you know this bar and that's for people who were who were in hurricanes and pe- people who were in areas that flooded there was no um there was no notification uh 
the the other thing that deaf people always talk about is when you go to an airport and I'm just not really like New York or LA, but they change gates and they don't tell you that they change gates. And suddenly you're with 200 people and suddenly you're standing alone and you don't know why. And there's nobody to ask. So now there's alerts in, in airports <coughs> and bus stations and train stations where they tell you where the stop is because you can't hear what they're telling you or there's no sign language. So, um, I feel that they've come a long way. Uh, entertainment came first, <coughs> excuse me, because um, they want deaf people to spend money on their movie tubes. Can I just add to what you said there, Nancy, because I think that point about being resourceful, I think we, <coughs> we, try, to talk, we try to talk to to people who may not be, who may be new to accessibility and not really understand uh, the challenges, we, we try to talk about the fact that, you know, people with disabilities are the original life hackers because they have to figure out things to do things in a way that aren't just facilitated for them, right? So they have to figure these things out and do these workarounds. Ingenious, innovative. I mean, that's why we always try to talk about accessibility from that perspective of innovation, invention, creativity, because at, from my experience, you are so spot on that, you know, resourceful, innovative, creative people are people with disabilities. One, um, just go ahead. That I think a sense of humor is very important here so that people are not afraid of you. Uh, you know, the first time I met with studio executives, I think they thought, you know, I had I had horns coming out of me or I had a tail or because they were they were really afraid to meet somebody with a disability because they were afraid of looking stupid. So I think particularly when you tell somebody, you know, I'm deaf or I have a hearing loss or I can't understand in this environment, you got to give them a solution. You can't just say I'm deaf, figure it out because they won't be able to. So, you know, you put yourself one step ahead if you give them a solution. This is, this is all great stuff. And, and just one more thing, Nancy, since you mentioned um, that your husband's a, a music agent. Uh, from what I understand, there's a, a really nice music scene in the deaf community, um, but it's more around the vibrations, like loud music where you can feel the rhythm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, there's funny, there's one organization called the Association of Late Deaf and Adults, known as ALDA. And their closing night party um, at every convention is they hand out balloons to all the attendees, they hand out earplugs to all the, the staff, and then they have a cut at 10 where they have to, because they're in a hotel, and they, they feel the music through the balloons. Um, there are other um, uh, solutions where they use sound, they use color, they use uh, different shapes to, you know, d determine that. Uh, I happen to be involved in a research project right now at USC that is a music appreciation. I think I'm the only one there that doesn't play an instrument. So they're all talking, and they're all post-lingually deaf. So they're talking about pitches and tones and all these things that I don't know about. But, you know, I sit there because I figure, you know, I will learn something. Um, I have always shied away from music because it was such a... Uh, a painful experience until my implant, uh, but now they're they're pushing me into it. And each week, there's a new instrument, there's a description they play. Um, so it's a, it's a ten week uh, program. So it'll be interesting to see what happens at the end of it. Uh, most people get implants because they want to hear music again, uh, but then in one session they played Moonlight Sonata. I have no. Uh, Oh, I have no memory of that because I never heard that when I was hearing. And this one woman said, that doesn't sound anything like Moonlight Sonata that I know. So with implants, everybody hears differently. Uh, some people said piano was trashing in a very pure piano tone for me. Uh, so those are some different challenges that, you know, waiting for your brain to connect and hear is the way we think we hear. Um, but yes, music is one of the, the, the biggest things that people want to listen to. Fascinating. Really fascinating. I, I could probably listen to you speak about this all day. 
Um, but I'm going to pass it on to Jeremy to tell us uh, about his journey into accessibility. Uh, well, my personal connection with access accessibility started with my son, Ethan Seta, um, who was quite obviously autistic at one year old. Um, and uh, I read that early intervention was kind of the key to get him what he needed to, um, well, just make some enough improvements to, to be functioning um, as, within a job and society. And I started kind of looking at it from a standpoint of, uh, well, who throughout history has had autism and, you know, would, would actually look at people who were obviously autistic um, and then um, some genius people um, who had this amazing focus for whatever they're doing. Uh, a good example is Michelangelo is their specu historian speculate that he is uh, actually autistic because if you look at the drawings that he made um, leading up to painting the Sistine Chapel, there's just so much detail and who else could spend the majority of their waking hours on their back painting a ceiling of a building for years and years and years. It would, you could say, well, somebody who has passion, I think goes beyond that. So I try to look at it from that perspective too, of how can this turn into a strength for somebody? Um, and with Ethan, it's, it's been very cool to see that journey. He's 19 and um, just, he has some, he has some things that I, I wish he would focus on, but the things he does focus on, it's, it's really awesome to see him just go with it and say, wow, I don't have energy to even do half the work you're doing. Professionally, um, I started doing work in accessibility after a talk at Macromedia Max 2003. That's actually, um, they got bowed out by Adobe. So that's um, not a slip up. It was under um, when Flash was still a Macromedia product. And um, this gentleman by the name of Bob, Bob Reagan, uh, I was just really intrigued by the title of his uh, talk, which was something to the effect of Flash developers, stop making life hell for people with disabilities. I was like, well, that one sounds better than any of these others that I uh, have no idea you know, what they're talking about in this title. And um, it was amazing how 40 minutes just really changed my perception on the work that I was doing. Um, here, I thought it was very creative and cool and clever. And um, just hearing about the experiences that um, I potentially was creating um, for people who were blind, low vision, really got me thinking about how I developed um, websites and web applications. And, you know, 2003, it's been a long time, but it's, it's the journey has taught me so much and it's just continual learning. Uh, I've had to collaborate, obviously, and a lot of humility along the way. Uh, people that, you know, kind of get early on the game um, might say something like to the effect of, oh, now I have this thing that's fully accessible. And it's like, I would never say that just because from a, uh, well, one, there's the, the whole um, uh, just liability aspect of it. But then too, it's like, you know, who am I to think that this couldn't be better? You know, it's just like, even when I turn something over, um, turn something, give somebody uh, an accommodation or whatnot, it's like, first thing I'm bet I'm gonna say is, let me know how you think this could be better or let me know if this has some pain points where I can make improvement. And um, I think that's what keeps me just uh, passionate about this job is just continual learning and knowing that everything I, I do, it's never done. It's just an iteration of it. Um, other than that, uh, I, I tend to, I, I do like gravitating towards uh, some of these, these, these movies where they're taking um, a disability and, and, and turning it around where it actually becomes advantageous to uh, somebody like a, a quiet place. If you've seen that is, is one of um, a very cool film. And for somebody who, who likes suspenseful films where um, the hero more or less is, is a, a young lady who, who is deaf. That's, that's just so cool. Uh, but I, I wanted to kind of mention a, a new movie I, I saw this weekend upside uh, with Kevin Hart. I'm a big Kevin Hart fan. Um, he's a great comedian. But that uh, movie really kind of gets into um, just just kind of the personal aspect and the friendship and and how Kevin Hart doesn't treat this this gentleman who is um, quadriplegic doesn't treat him differently than anybody else. And then he's kind of trying to open the world to him and say, "Hey, talk to him. Don't talk to me. I'm you know I'm just his friend here. You know I 
we're just taking an order, talk to him to ask him what he wants. And I, I just, I love seeing that more and more um, become front and center in, in movies and TV shows like a, you know, the good examples, the walking dead, a lot of the new characters um, are, I think there's yeah two of the new characters um, are uh, deaf, hard of hearing. And it's just really cool to see that and to see how uh, in certain scenes they can use sign language to communicate with people without saying a word to anybody else and more or less give some plan of what's going about to happen. So um, yeah, as far as like showbiz and whatnot, I, that's kind of, uh, I love seeing this stuff more front and center. And I think that's also going to help um, push accessibility forward. It, it's, it's gradual and incremental, just gradually getting people to understand um, how to interact with folks with disabilities and, and to look at the world through their eyes instead of um, limiting it to the lens that they know. Yeah, and, and I love all of your mention, and this is AI showbiz, so you, mm -hmm. you brought in the showbiz part to this panel, uh, and those are great examples. There's other examples like Fargo, um, Breaking Bad. Um, the idea is that you bring in a character that's a, a character. You're not bringing in a disability, which mm -hmm. is the way media used to cover this a lot. Um, and now a nonfiction one, I don't know if any of you have seen, is uh, Free Solo. That is the oh, scariest movie I have ever seen. And it's about Alex Honnold, who scaled um, in uh, Yellowstone. What's the, the mountain there? Um, it'll come to me, but it's in Star Trek with that steep, like straight up. And, uh, and he did that without any ropes. And he's, he's pretty clearly on the spectrum. And he could, it's like Michelangelo. He, he, you know, another person who was famous for, for, for climbing that mountain said that, uh, that, this, if he achieves this, and, and he said this before it was done, it is basically like an Olympic athlete who has to have a gold medal winning performance. And if he is off by a quarter of an inch, he dies. And that could not have been achieved <laughs> without somebody who's on the spectrum. So super interesting. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question, Sharon. But first, uh, since we were, we're speaking um, earlier about music um, and people who are deaf, I saw the most amazing keynote last year at Access U, your conference, um, with Haben Gurma, who, who showed what it was like to dance. So you want to speak to, to Haben a little bit, and then I'll ask you your question. Well, we were thrilled that she was our keynote last year. I mean, she's... She's so accomplished. She's uh, uh, the first deaf-blind graduate of Harvard Law School. So she's brilliant. She's beautiful. And she's just full of adventure of life. And uh, so she, she would tell us all these stories about dancing and going surfing. And, um, and, and she had videos where, where she uh, showed some of her adventures. And... Uh, and somebody asked her, you know, she said, she said, oh, and I'm going to have a book coming out next fall. She said, I've been meaning to write it for a long time, but I've just been too busy having fun. And she's just such a great example of somebody who, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just like what Jeremy said. There's, you know, people live their lives and the disability is a, is a part of, of course, it's part of who they are, but it's only a part. And that spirit of, um, of just the joy of life and and the sense of adventure was just present in everything she did. I thought. I mean, she did the keynote, and then she she also came uh, in the evening. She came to a happy hour, and she had a device where if you wanted to talk to her, you typed into it, and it showed up on her braille display so that she could. And then um, she would type back to you, and you'd see it on a screen, or she would just talk to you because her voice. Her voice was very high, high, high for the high register. And somebody asked her about that. And she said, well, that's where I have some hearing. So she was taught by a voice coach to speak up in these high registers because then at least she could hear herself. Yeah, she's got a book. I, I wish I'd known you were going to ask me about Haben, Joe, because then I would have remembered the name of her book. But, oh, it's called um, Haben. It's just called Haben. I, Why I, if I remember I correctly, that? it was a great book. <laughs> It um, is a great book, and it gives that same sense of vitality and enjoyment, and you know, it's like 
it's she, just she had comedic just, timing in her keynote. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It was so polished and and that that comedic timing. I was like, how do you have comedic timing and respond to events when you can't see or hear? It it, it was incredible. And yeah. and what was interesting is in speaking to her, as you said, with a keyboard, I, I was asking her questions and then I hit the enter key and then she would reply. I would ask another question, look over at her, hit the enter key, and then she would reply. And then I realized, I'm like, you don't actually need me to hit enter to read what I'm saying, do you? Because and she comes across. Yeah, she's like, no, but some people like to hit enter. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> it's so funny. I know. She's wonderful. She <laughs> yeah. was just great. Yeah. Oh, we have, is that Molly? That doesn't look like Molly. We have a new speaker here. I've, I've, are you a from the next? A new speaker named Molly. Oh, Molly um, Lovett. I'm just jumping in. Um, they're all named Molly because we're sharing my link. So uh, don't, now it's Sandra. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be people coming from the next panel. Continue in. I love the okay. movie Free Solo, and I never knew how you could accomplish that. Thank you for explaining that. Sure thing. So I'm only a third way through the question. So when you want us to start wrapping, let us know, Molly, okay? Um, you've got about 10 minutes left uh, to, okay. to keep going. So you're doing good. Okay, great. So Sharon, I wanted to ask you, you have a nonprofit and it's a digital accessibility focus. Can you speak to what the funding landscape is during the current crisis? Well, you know, that's it's interestingly... People are interestingly clueless still about, you know, they, and, and this happened after the financial crisis of 2008 too. They say, well, our, we're going to redistribute our funding to meet basic needs, to meet basic needs. Well, for someone with a disability who's now isolated at home and they have to go to school or they have to go to work or they have to go to telemedicine, everything is remote. I think that you can't overlook the fact that that kind of connectivity is a basic need, but most funders really do not understand that. And I think it's, you know, I think it's common to just the general understanding of accessibility that, um, that you think, well, the information is online, but the information that's online, if it's not accessible and what was it? Uh, some more than half of the, COVID-19 information that's put out by states and the executive orders that are put out by governors and information coming from the White House is posted to inaccessible websites or on inaccessible PDF documents. So putting people with disabilities at that kind of a disadvantage seems to me like it is uh, neglecting basic needs, but getting that, that sort of mm, understanding to funding organizations is really a challenge. And I don't know, Jeremy, you work in a university. Do you find that's true at the university too, as students are sent home to work that, that yes, they're given um, what they need? There's is it only in the nonprofit this, sector? Uh, I think it must be true other, in other areas. Um, well, let me speak to, to one since I know we're um, running short on time, but um, I think it's it's definitely given a lot more prevalence to the need for accessible resources and the realization like, well, who pays for this or who does the work? People just hand me videos and say, well, here, just take it and do whatever with it. It's like, no, I, you know, it, it's, um, it's not uh, fathomable. It's, it's not sustainable for a person or department, one person or one department to handle all the accessibility needs for an institution. And I think that's where people start thinking like, well, how are we going to pay for this? And, and um, uh, all, all the captioning and all the audio description that needs to be done. And that's so, where oh, we wish funders would step in and, yeah. you know, empower organizations like ours. And there are so many others like, like that who provide technical support to people with disabilities. And if funders would understand that and fund that work, it would make a big difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was, uh, you kind of asked the question I was about to ask uh, Jeremy. So I'm going to... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's actually good because we want to keep it moving. So um, uh, Molly, are there any questions from the yeah, audience? I was just, just going to come on and I think now because you've got uh, six minutes, maybe I would like to recommend we go to questions if that's okay. all right. Yeah, perfect. 
And I, I do want to uh, point out how significant this panel is because awareness is the beginning of solutions. And um, I, a quick note, uh, years ago when I was the director of communications at Weston Hotels, um, it was the, the, the ADA got passed and I put the entire executive committee into a disabled situation, a wheelchair, unable to hear, unable to see. And before we had been trying to implement the things that you've all been uh, talking about and nothing happened, but when, when they had to spend a day and couldn't drink out of the drinking fountain because it was the wrong height or dial the phone because it was inaccessible, everything changed. So I applaud what you're doing immensely. And along those lines, I'd like to, uh, that's the context for my question what still is the most significant thing that you each think needs to get changed, especially in a COVID pandemic world that we find ourselves in? Nancy, can we start with you? You're on mute. I'd like to speak to that. Um, uh, one of the issues with, and I, I, I don't mean to get political, but with this administration is, uh, first of all, the day Trump took office, he took down the disability website and it's never been put back. Um, he, it is the only briefing every day where there's no interpreter. Uh, yes, of course there are captions because there have to be captions. It's uh, mandated by the law. But the question now is, and I'm sure Molly's figuring this out, is that um, it's uh, being a captioner is a very specific skill. It's a very difficult skill. Um, Eighty-five percent of people flunk out of court reporting school. So mm -hmm. now, as people are aging out of the first wave of, you know, cart people, it's really difficult to make sure that things are, you know, covered. Whether it's classrooms or, you know, emergency notifications. Or uh, I remember during 9/11, uh, the all the uh, broadcast cart people. Uh, were they were stringing together and we didn't have the kind of internet that we have now but they were working 24 7 to keep people informed so Colorado a Colorado captioner would be hooked into somebody from Arizona and then they just kind of rotated just to keep the coverage up times three networks you know times cable um, and it was just they were like the frontline heroes there because without that, we wouldn't have known anything that's going on. And they literally exhausted themselves doing it. So um, I, I don't think, I, I think the last four years have really been a step back for accessibility, uh, and particularly with all the technology coming out. And I, I hope going forward that, um, that disability groups will really push on and push forward and to get kind of back to where we were four years ago. Thank you. Um, I really uh, appreciate that answer. If, if the rest of you would like to continue answering, and I'm going to take myself off the screen so people can uh, concentrate on the panel. Sharon, Jeremy? If I jump in, um, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But um, again, I use resilient jujitsu as an analogy. And when you're in a bad place in jujitsu, it's you're always going to fail if you try to make that situation 100% better. So it's something I tell my students is what's, can you find out how to make this situation 1% better? Because if you can see how to make that 1% better, you're probably going to see how to make it 2% better. And that's how you can incrementally get change to happen rather than just saying, I, this solution needs to be fixed hundred um, percent. And so to apply that to what's going on with the COVID-19 and everything is it's what are some things I can do to help um, people understand uh, there's accessibility needs. Um, for a real simple example, when I give presentations now, I insert some obscure pictures because then I know it automatically something to me. I have to explain this, what this picture means in the context of my presentation. I'm now providing an audio description for my presentation. And um, that's just something simple I do every day. I try to do every day with uh, my presentations is is inject a little bit of difference um, so that people might come up to me and ask a question of why did you describe all those pictures in your presentation? Why don't you just get rid of them if they if you have to describe them? It's like because this is getting me in the habit of actually providing accessible content. That's a great example. 
Um, and then Sharon, uh, I'd also like to prompt you when you finish telling your comments to tell us about any interesting events that are about to come up in eight days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Joe. That was a nice softball. Um, well, I, my, my main issue about this, uh, about accessibility has always been developers, people who make the technology have to know about it, have to understand it. I mean, you can't become an architect if you don't understand how wide the doors have to be and what the ramps have to be. And the fact that people come out of four years of computer science or web administration without even ever hearing about accessibility needs to me is, is it's way past time for that to stop. We need to have that sort of instruction integrated so that, I mean, when you start learning about it in high school, you should be thinking about alt text and form controls and keyboard access and those very, very basic things that can just be integrated as you learn. And you know, there's an effort called Teach Access that's out of Silicon Valley, where they're trying really hard to work with universities and schools and to get this integrated, they get prizes to teachers. I think, um, Teach Access, and, and there are people in high schools who have gotten the accessibility light that went on. And so once that happens and the people who are actually making the technology have an understanding and can implement, I think we, we, we will go farther faster. than. But I agree with you about incremental. Well, you can't be perfect overnight, but that education and getting people to integrate into the way they do whatever it is they do on the web is is really important and as far as the event we have an event next week starting next week on may 13th 13th 14th 19th and 20th we have an annual event which joe graced us with his presence last year and talked about hobbin hobbin germa who was our uh one of our keynotes joe was the other one and we um we had it all planned for may this year it's not going to happen at St. Edwards University like it usually does, but it's going to happen online. So Access U is from, it's linked from our website, nobility.org. That's K-N-O-W-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot org. Maybe I'll put that in the chat. And, uh, and since you guys are here, I'll tell you that if you put Rush, my last name, Rush, 2020, you'll get $100, $100 off, the, uh, off the price. So how's that? <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. That's awesome. So I think I'm going to wrap up now uh, and give give time for the next attendees to prepare. But I will say that Global Accessibility Awareness Day is the day after Access U wraps up. Uh, and if you are not making your products accessible, Sharon was right on the money. And I'll give you a simple example. If you're a designer and you're designing something like Skype uh, or Slack, and you have an online indicator that's either red or green, that says you're online or offline, you have a, a massive population of people who are colorblind who cannot tell the difference between red and green. And if you know about accessibility, you'll know that you have to have an indicator that says online or offline. And this is why if you, you, if you wanna have a high quality in your craft, whether you're a designer, a developer, a product person, you need to know about accessibility in order to have really well-crafted products. So if you want to learn more about it, uh, attend Access U, uh, follow these experts, and follow the, the GAD hashtag, G-A-A-D, on Twitter. It goes completely insane uh, every single GAD day. So thank you again for the opportunity, Molly. And uh, we really, really enjoyed it. I appreciate all of these incredible panelists uh, who I've gotten to know personally. And we'll catch you at the next AI Showbiz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.